Hello YouTubers, this is the Nubifier, and welcome to the next installation of the Ship History series. The feedback so far has been very positive. The Ship History videos take a lot of time to research, verify, vet, and script. So please, if you enjoy the video, support by linking it to a friend or orgmate. Just like the Freelancer and Cutlass History videos, I posted to Twitter seeking creative variant ideas from the community. So, in no particular order, this is what they came up with. The Origin 341 ML Brewer's Edition, 341 is the volume of a beer bottle in milliliters. It's outfit with specialized keg coolers and internal dampeners to reduce sloshing and foaming. There's the 311B local info variant. You call up the information 311 on your comms and this ship delivers flyers about the systems and events and attractions directly to you. The 365 MS for monthly subscription. This variant requires $20 a month monthly subscription in order for you to access and fly the ship. The 345PE Pythagorean Theorem Edition. This variant has a special nav computer that permits the ship to bypass all of the regular QT limitations by plotting a complex course directly to your destination. The 3007 License to Kill. This variant will let you kill anyone without a crime stat, but it costs five times more in the store. This is our first pay to win ship on the list. The 357ME for Magnum Edition. This variant has a special size five mass driver attached to the nose. The 360PE for Panoramic Edition. This variant has a transparent hull, giving the pilot a full panoramic view of their surroundings, a bit like how Wonder Woman's jet used to work in the comics. The 300S for Salvage Edition. This variant replaces the nose weapon with a robotic arm, and it also has modified doors and storage to store the scrap. The 390 Jump. Shouldn't have to tell you about that one. The 399 BBE, or Big Benny's Edition. Hot noodles in a box to you. The 369P for the mobile pornographic studio that has tripods, cameras, lighting, and the internal temperature is set to 30 degrees. The 300 Ice, Microtech's famous Blue Ice Mountain Brewing Company made this special variant. The 300 HDE for hot tub edition. The rear living area is replaced with a glass bottom hot tub and the upper part of the hull is also replaced with glass so that you have a nice view. The 340 RTE for rear train experience. The bed and dining area are replaced with four luxury seats with two pairs facing each other with a little table in the middle so you can play cards. The i300 Apple variant. This is meant for telecon service and repair. It comes with iTunes for as long as you pay the insurance and the interior design was inspired by Otterbox. The 399S for stealth, which is armored VIP transport for VIPs. It has good speed, good armor and average weapons. The 333P2W or pay to win. This replaces the interior space with a top-mounted MLRS, plus two top-mounted size 2 hardpoints. This variant is 12 times the cost of the original 300i. And the 300H for Space Hearse. The dead bodies need to go somewhere, might as well send them in style. Today I'm going to tackle the original Kickstarter ship series, the 300. Be sure to check out the complete history of the F8 Lightning, the Troubled Cutlass, and the Freelancer in this growing series. Let's begin. On the 4th of March, 1983, brothers Richard and Robert Garriott, their astronaut engineer father, Owen, and programmer Chuck Bushy founded a company based in a garage in Houston, Texas. This small startup shocked the industry when they created and published Ultima 3 Exodus during a crash in the video game industry. Ultima 3 was a hit with fans and it gave the company the capital that it needed to expand. They survived when others failed and went bankrupt. By 1988, that company had become more legit than a garage operation, with 15 developers in Austin, Texas, and another 35 employees in New Hampshire. In September 1992, Electronic Arts acquired the company for $35 million in stock, despite a dispute between the two companies over EA's game, Deathlord. The company continued to operate independently, despite being owned by EA. They grew to 300 employees, most of whom were divided amongst small, largely autonomous development teams. In 1992, they released the massively popular, massively groundbreaking, massively multiplayer online title Ultima Online, and this would set the bar high for the rest of the industry. Due to their vision that online was the future of gaming, they decided to focus only on online titles exclusively from then on. They released Ultima 9, Ultima Online 2, Ultima 10, and somewhere in the mix of all that was a little MS-DOS game called Privateer. Privateer, as many of you know, was the sequel to Wing Commander. As I discussed in the history of the Freelancer video, Chris Roberts seems to be a sentimental guy who remembers his past. When deciding on the name for the ship manufacturers in his new game universe called Star Citizen, Chris decided once again to pay homage to his past. 
all of this is significant to our story today because that game company was Origin Systems, and this is why we have the luxury brand Origin Jumpworks. During the Kickstarter campaign from the 18th of October 2012 and on, there were options to pledge for the Aurora, the Freelancer, the Cutlass, the Hornet, and the Constellation. The 300i was also an initial pledge option that was offered as the Bounty Hunter Pack, with no variants announced at that time. 5,700 original citizens backed the $60 game package during the Kickstarter, having never seen any concept literature or art. Two months had passed, and the first look at the 300i was in episode 1-1 of Jump Point, published on the 21st of December 2012. The initial concept of the 300i was described as a stylish BMW-esque ship. BMW numbers its products where the first number is the series and the subsequent numbers denote the trim. A 1 series would be entry level, a 5 series would be high, and a 7 series would be ultra. The brand Origin Jumpworks continues to employ this throughout its entire lineup all the way from the 100i to the 890 Jump. The design was outsourced to a design studio called Massive Black. Its original concept was designed by Camp Remillard, a senior concept artist at Massive Black, and based on my research, the work was done in less than two months. That initial concept was given to Chris Smith, the senior 3D artist at CIG LA, and was worked on with the help of Eli McNeil, who worked as a concept artist at CIG Austin. Chris Smith had been at the company since the very start, being quoted as saying that he was employee number 14. On the 21st of June, 2013, as funding passed 20 million, CIG announced the variants that went on sale immediately. Two weeks later on Inside Cloud Imperium, published on the 2nd of July, 2013, Eric Wingman Peterson interviewed Chris Smith, and that's when we were shown the first digital renders of the 300i. Chris Smith initially showed us the 2D concept art that was approved by Chris Roberts, and then transferred over to a quick blockout and cry engine that was done by Massive Black. Chris Smith said that the original model was pretty rough and he needed then to refine the shape by adding vertices. He said that their standard is much higher than what was expected by the industry. So refining the polygons also rounded out the shape and improved the overall look. On the show, he said that he had spent months getting it to the current level of detail. During that show, he also showed us the 315P variant with a different engine. Eric Pearson also interviewed Brian Brewer, an animator working on the 300i. Care was considered to ensure that the components would actually fit in the hull, that the mechanical parts that were load-bearing could actually support the weight. Landing gear was painstakingly animated to ensure that even the parts that we would never see worked as if they were real. Gas shocks would compress, parts folded and collapsed such to remain compact. Despite being faked in a game engine, the design wasn't fake. Even the wheels on the landing gear looked legit, with large drill holes in the alloy to reduce weight, and I found it very difficult to actually see vertices in this new 3D model. The side door would first unlatch and then bump out, then lift open on a complex hinge, which was all done to produce a believable looking door that would create a seal with the vacuum of space. Even the engine afterburner was highly complicated. Back in 2013, this was seen as excessive detail within the industry. I remember seeing that video when it was released in 2013. My mind was blown because I hadn't seen anything to that detail ever before in a video game. Brian showed off even more of the animations he had completed, and it just kept looking better and better. We should probably discuss the variants in this series, which are as follows. The base 300i package was sold on Kickstarter as the Bounty Hunter, and that would be sold at $65 with LTI. It had basic cargo, two size 3 Omnisky, some blank missile pylons on the wing, and an empty nose hardpoint for upgrades. The 315P Explorer variant was sold as the new Pathfinder package, which was introduced in 2013 after the Kickstarter for a $10 premium. It listed a larger main engine, better power plant, better scanners, plus it would come with a tractor unit on the nose hardpoint. The 325A Fighter variant, which was sold as the Arbiter package, was introduced in 2013 after Kickstarter for $15 over base, and even today, it's a pretty good value. It listed stronger shields, better armor, plus an advanced targeting system. If memory serves, at the time, the ship was sold as one of the only ones who could lock and fire multiple missiles on multiple targets because of this high-tech targeting computer. The nose mounted a single mass driver, and the wing pylons had rails for missiles. The 350R was sold as the light speed package, which was introduced after Kickstarter for a $55 premium over base. Ouch. It listed a major retooling of the entire rear section mounting two main thrusters in a special cowling. It came with minimal weapons, mounting only a pair of size 2, it was 10% lighter, shedding 3,000 kilograms, it had minimal cargo space, and a custom black paint scheme. 
Backers backed the game by choosing the ship that they felt best suited what they wanted to do in the future. The first player usable demo, for lack of a better term, was called the Hangar Module, which was followed up by Arena Commander. The Hangar Module was what we had while we waited for more development on the IFCS and the simulation. Two months after the 300 series concept sale on the 27th of August 2013, players could finally load up and log into the hangar to see their 300 for the first time. On the 4th of June 2014, 10 months later, Star Citizen added what was simply called the Dogfighting Module 0.9.2. The game would be developed as modules which would become Hangar, Dogfighting, FPS and Social. Dogfighting was later renamed Arena Commander, Social Module was a small chunk of Area 18, it was removed shortly after the release of the Persistent Universe, FPS module was renamed Star Marine, and the Hangar module is basically useless now as we have hangars at various landing zones throughout the Persistent Universe. 15 August 2014, three months after the release of 0.9.2 Dogfighting module, the hype was spun up for Arena Commander with a racing module component titled the Murray Cup. One month later, on the 15th of September 2014, we have one of the most iconic videos featuring a Top Gear style race between an M50 and a 350R. Despite it being cinematic, we were assured that it was all recorded in engine. It looked like no other game at the time, and this helped solidify the community's confidence in the project. Three months later, just in time for the holidays on the 22nd of December 2014, Patch 1.0 Arena Commander was released with a more refined IFCS and a flyable 300i. This incidentally was when I decided to switch from being a lurker to a backer, finally picking up an Aurora LN. AC 1.1 launched 6 months after that on the 10th of April 2015 with even better polish to the systems. With patch 2.0 we saw Port Olisar for the first time and the launch of the baby persistent universe. At the time the 300 series, like all other ships, were just a means of getting around as we didn't have missions and cargo. When cargo and cargo terminals were added, it became painfully obvious that the 300 wouldn't allow any way for a player to hand load small boxes. The 300 series, the Aurora, the Mustang, all would need an overhaul in the future. On the 9th of December 2017, on an ATV, Chris Smith announced that the 300i would get a rework, and it wouldn't be until the 28th of May 2019, over 17 months later, that we would get it. So, was it worth the wait? I think so. The 300i became larger, which made more sense as the 100 series took the place of the starter. The extra space allowed for the frame to be stretched, the lower hull now drops down to load and unload cargo, the interior has room for a full bunk and a kitchenette with options. It flew very well, I think it looks great, the cargo issue is mostly fixed, there was a balance pass on the hard points, the pilot's view was improved, and we finally had a very strong starter option. We're almost done but not quite. The 300 series is currently being used as a test series for the store customizer, which like everything in Star Citizen generated some controversy. I say controversy because what this will let you do is pay real money to change the paint on your ship, upgrade the trim, and add some other stuff. This has more to do with the future of the game rather than the 300 series, so I simply wanted to highlight that it was a cool milestone for the 300. I'll post some links on the video and the description so that you can check it out. And that's it. The Complete History of the 300 series. If you've made it all the way to the end, thank you for spending your time with me. I'm not perfect, so please post any details that I may have missed in the comments. Please post which 300 you like and why. This type of video takes days of work, so if you liked it, please share with others, get it the audience it deserves, and check out the other videos in the series. Fly safe and I'll see you in the verse.